Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom, and we are in the book of Esther today. Uh, we have several different directions we want to go with our discussion of the book of Esther. Um, the direction we do not want to go is simply telling the story, because you can read it. It's very easy to understand in your Bible. Open your Bible and read it. Right now, pause the podcast. Great. Welcome back. You've finished reading it. Um, can we have the executive summary, perhaps? <laughs> an executive summary? Sounds like an execution or something. Well, Funny you should mention executions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's set in Persia. The, the time is the captivity. Um, well, actually kind of after the captivity. Not everybody's gone back, but a lot of people have. So we're somewhere in the middle of Ezra, most likely, with Nehemiah's story coming after this. The uh, king, who uh, is called Ahasuerus here, and I'm not going to defend this, I'm just going to say up front that I, unlike most people, I think this is Darius, who was... Um, one of Cyrus's generals, and eventually took the throne. There was Cyrus, there was Cambyses, there was an imposter, and then Darius wiped out the imposter, took control, settled things down. Uh, and if that's the proper interpretation, here we are, he's, he's established uh, himself on the throne, and he throws a big party, and he calls for his queen, and she doesn't want to show herself off, and the, the advisors say, de-queen her. She's not divorced, but she is de decrowned. And then the advisors, fearing that uh, Darius may or Hazarius may get back with this queen Vashti, suggest, and yes, I have called it in the past a beauty contest. And we're going to take a look at that in a bit. He is minister's order. Lots of pretty young girls from all over the place collected, and they're going to come to him, and he's going to pick one of them to be his queen. And that's how it opens. The, we are now focused upon a young Jewish girl, actually a Benjamite, named Esther. That's her Persian name. Her Hebrew name is Hadassah, which means myrtle or myrtle tree. We, we, if you read Zechariah, myrtle trees show up. There's, so there's, there's some significance there. She's an orphan. And Mordecai, uh, an older cousin or uncle, um, has taken care of her. Mordecai is an important figure. He's mentioned in Ezra as coming back in the first return, but now he's back here sitting in the king's gate. So he's some kind of official, probably representing Jerusalem or Judea, either politically or economically, financially. And when the soldiers come to collect girls, he knows he can't really stop this, but he has a couple of pieces of, his, of advice for her. Mostly, don't tell anybody you're a Jew. He doesn't explain why, and we're never told why exactly. But she is a very obedient young lady, as well as very beautiful, and she does what he's told. So she swept into the palace intrigue of this, choosing a new wife, actually a number of new wives for the harem. And that part of the story kind, kind of stops there. So she's, she's in... She's the new queen. Uh, the emperor loves her, whatever that means at this point. Uh, and one last footnote that seems at the time not terribly important, but Mordecai learns of a plot to assassinate the emperor, tells Esther. Esther reports it in his name. It gets written in the Chronicles. The would-be assassins are captured and hung. And that's that. Now, before we go on with the plot line, some things I think... Interesting. Yeah, that I I just thought of is you can kind of consider Haman's plot to exterminate the Jews more or less just collateral damage for getting rid of Mordecai. Yeah, and we're having here the literary foreshadowing of his mm. own fate. Yes, where people trying to unlawfully take life are hung. Yes, and spoiler alert. Uh, but you you've just read uh, Esther after pausing. Yeah, <laughs> is that. Haman is ultimately hung for trying to, on a broader scale, assassinate yeah. Mordecai and all of his family and relatives. You know, I just caught that in my last read through Esther, which was within a week or so. 
the the foreshadowing the the similarity there so good good job catching that yeah it's hanging people on trees we've seen it before in scripture we're going to see it again in scripture <laughs> and this comes back a lot yeah and, and interestingly enough most of the time it's the bad guys who get hung Mm-hmm. We uh, that always gets me with Absalom. I'm like, yeah. I'm seeing all this imagery, but he's the bad guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was teaching um, a bunch of high schoolers, and we we're going through Judges, where some of the kings of the Canaanites are trapped in a cave and then brought out and hung on trees. And I looked at that and said, this mm-hmm. seems so messianic. But they're the bad guys. I I, I, I told my class, I, there's something here, and I'm just missing it. And one one young lady raised her hand and said, "Yeah, but they were they were hung on trees. And they were put back in the cave, and stones were rolled in front of them, and they never came out again." Mm-hmm. Oh, a reverse image. I get it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I don't remember if it, I don't remember who to attribute it to, but somebody pointed out like these are. These are failed types of yeah. Christ. He, you know, Absalom is a failed Messiah. He's the son of the king. He is the mm-hmm. heir to the throne of David. Mm-hmm. He he wins the hearts of the people. Yeah. He wins the hearts of the people. He he is. He, he fits a lot of the the little bullet points. Right. If, <laughs> if all you were concerned with were the bullet points yeah. and not like <laughs> the decrepit morality, um, <laughs> and. Even even more so, all the failed types that show up, they're, you know, they're not just failed types and reverse types. They're also, in a sense, real types mm-hmm. because Christ becomes sin yes. Yes. on the cross. Yes. Excellent. Mm-hmm. And so that that is a very clear connection of saying, yeah, when you see Jesus go onto the cross, that is him. Very fully identifying with sinful humanity mm-hmm. and with his people's sins. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. So, we're, 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 as you said, spoiler alert: we're, we're, we're going to get to Mordecai <laughs> or to uh, sorry Haman and his execution. It said the King James says gallows. The Hebrew says it's a tree, and it's not completely clear whether he was hung by a rope or simply impaled on the thing. And it doesn't matter a whole lot. The type doesn't have to be that exact. It could be both. <laughs> Symbology, be, the same. <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, you, know, you look at it. Well, Jesus was hung and impaled on, uh, on the cross. Yeah. There you go. Well, turning back to the story, you've already mentioned Haman, so let's bring him on stage. He is an Agagite, uh, and, and the text doesn't go further to explain that. Again, the Bible always assumes we've read everything to that point and taken notes. <laughs> uh, Agag is the name of given the dynasty of kings of Amalek. And Amaleks, we go all the way back to the Exodus when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt. The Amalekites, who were a sort of nomadic desert people, come up behind Israel and attack them from the rear. So they're kind of sneaky and they're kind of nasty and they're very violent. And they um, they they try to take out God's people, to take out the weak and the stragglers. And that's where we first run into Joshua, too. Joshua leads the army into battle, and Moses stands on the hill. As long as his hands are lifted to heaven, Israel wins. If he drops his hands, Israel loses. The point being that that begins the battle, and at the end of that, when Amalek has been chased off, God swears to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And we run into Amalek in the book of Judges, mostly mercenaries. Uh, In the time of Saul, Saul is commissioned to destroy them once forever, and doesn't, he instead leads a triumphal parade, uh, including the the king of the Amalekites. Uh, David has to deal with them some later. And here we are at the end of Old Testament history, and we still have one of these guys on stage. He's worked his way up through the uh, Persian administration. He's just short of being prime minister to the emperor. In fact, he may actually hold that title uh, after a while. Uh, he's a big deal, and um, he he doesn't seem to have any peculiar religious or ideological problem with the Jews as such. He just wants to be important and doesn't like it when people don't treat him that way. <laughs> and and we run into Mordecai now. Mordecai has been told, everyone's been told to bow when Haman approaches, and Mordecai won't. 
And when people ask him his reason, he says, because I'm a Jew. And, and, and that's something we can talk about. The, um, he doesn't say, because the law of my God forbids it, because the law of his God didn't forbid it. And there's plenty of instances where godly people bow down to pagan rulers to show them respect because men are in the image of God and made by God's own hand, and there's no, there's no sin there. It, it seems to be the purely nationalistic, well, our nations have hated each other forever, so pff, I'm not showing you any kind of courtesy, whatever. Um, any, any thoughts about that or any other observations or uh, possible interpretations? I think it's Peter Lightheart who makes makes a big deal of Mordecai rejecting authority. Mm -hmm. And he kind of comes across, this is in his book, um, House for My Name. Right. And it comes across very sort of finger wagging, like, don't <laughs> be like Mordecai, don't mm -hmm. deny, defy authority. And I just, I do struggle with that reading mm -hmm. because there's never any sense in the text that God disapproved. Granted, we're not in a book where God is even <laughs> called by name. So yeah, the book is that, clearly too. not literarily about to tell us, no, God thought this was very bad. Don't do that. <laughs> um, and it's also not the way of scripture that we always see the bad results of bad behavior. Yeah. But mm -hmm. still, there's no sense of disapproval. There's no sense of it coming back to bite him later. Like you would just expect those things if, if Mordecai were yeah. in the wrong, literarily. Yeah, it gets it. The, I, I have an answer than a counter to my answer. Um, the first answer would be, well, Haman sees this and decides to take out the entire Jewish people, which is kind of a bad thing. Yeah, uh, the, uh, but that's a little out of proportion. <laughs> The, uh, the the response to that is that when things have settled down, Mordecai still does not bow down to Haman. And again, nothing bad seems to come of that. Uh, sometimes we don't know what's going on. Mordecai says it's because I'm a Jew. In his mind, that was a good reason. It was a reason he was willing really to die for. Mm -hmm. Because that's when you disobey the emperor's order, that is a likely consequence. So he took it very seriously, whatever his reasons were. I but I, some, go ahead. I know that for me, I I sort of land on the side of probably Peter Lightheart wagging my finger at Mordecai, <laughs> saying, "Really, dude, you you chose this battle." But I think there uh, one way that I could see it being justifiable mm -hmm. to an extent is the fact that. He comes from the Amalekites, mm -hmm. and so in a sense, you could almost you could almost make the argument: I'm just doing the same thing that God has declared I'm against I'm, you. I'm taking God's side against your you and your people because God. And we could pull that in. God had said to Moses and Joshua, "I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation." Mm -hmm. Yeah, which kind of sounds like no reprieve, no repentance. No salvation, and in which case Mordecai is saying, "I'm I'm taking God's side here." Yeah, that I'm also questioning what's involved in the reverence that's been commanded, because if it's what's supposed to be given to Caesar under Roman rule, that would be a problem. Yeah. Um, no, I mean the the pinch of incense saying. No, no, I, I I understand yeah. that, but since. We have Nehemiah and Esther and Ezra all functioning in the king's presence without any problem like that coming up. I think mm -hmm. that's unlikely. But that's for the king. That's not for Haman. Oh, <laughs> you mean, I don't think the emperor exalted Haman above himself. I think that yeah, one's that's pretty, unlikely. That's unlikely. So, and, and what I was going to say is sometimes we aren't given all the details and trying to ferret them out without, uh, maybe we've said something here that someone will think about and they'll write us and say, yeah, here's, you guys were on the right track on this one. You just should have followed it out. Okay. Well, write us and let us know what we missed. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case, we know, and I, and I was I'm mentioning, I think to you two before we started, there are conspiracies and there are conspiracies. This is a book about a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. It's a really lame conspiracy from <laughs> one point of view because Haman <laughs> begins it simply because his vanity is offended. There is one mm -hmm. man out of everyone else in the Persian court 
there's one man who won't bow down to him. But he I'm takes a, that man as a representative. Yeah, of the and, and, yeah. People. Well, apparently hmm. his his reasoning is I'm a Jew. Well, that means none of the Jews would bow to me. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you know when somebody says, "Me and all my friends are here." Sometimes we need to go and ask the friends because <laughs> they may not agree. You know, my this Marty is what said. I, what? <laughs> yeah, this is what this is what I believe, and my church agrees. Maybe the church doesn't. <laughs> Maybe you need to go talk to some people and get a little more information. There's a good deal in Proverbs about not saying what you think immediately, but searching things out before you commit yourself publicly. So on on, on that hand, this this yes, it's a very dangerous conspiracy. Yes, in some degrees, it changes redemptive history. It alters the course of history. Human conspiracies often do. And yet, the uh, there's, there's two but ifs. One, hell has a plan here. Hell is all about this. Hell has found a dupe who is so self-absorbed that he's willing to exterminate an entire people simply because one member of it will not bow to him. And, and with that people, the savior of the world. And with that, yes, and with that people, the savior of the world. That's what the book ultimately is about, we know. This is about the line of Christ. This is about the promise of Messiah. If Satan pulls this one off, then the gospel fails. God's promises fail. The covenant fails. It's all It's all over. And Satan's putting a lot on this one. Uh, and, and, and Haman does not have to understand this. this is a, as you two know, I think, I grew up in the midst of um, conspiracy theory and conspiracy thinking and all that. And the assumption always was that these people who, who are conspiring to do evil are very self-conscious, very intelligent. They have a plan that includes all of these things, and all of these things were meant for evil, and they're successfully one by one checking off the boxes, and it's just all falling into their hands. I, I've studied enough history since that even without my theology, I think I would begin to question that. <laughs> a lot of things that that happened that are bad happened. Yes, there was conspiracy behind it, and the conspiracy failed miserably. I'll give you an example. I, you were both in my class at one time, and you may remember me talking about Cecil Rhodes, who was the spokesman for British imperialism in the late Victorian period. The guy behind the Rhodes Scholarship, behind Rhodesia, um, behind an organization called the Round Table, and that organization, a conspiracy, modeled after the Jesuits, its design was to promote British culture around the world and to impo- basically to impose it, because British culture was the best culture. <laughs> it should be imposed in one way or another on everybody and should be the standard to which everyone is drawn. And in the name of that, these people did some very horrible things from promoting the African Boer Wars, uh, Anglo Boer Wars, Yikes. Um, to basically letting the feuds for both World War One and World War Two. Interesting thing is, by the time World War Two is done, there's no British Empire anymore. Britain is sidetracked. It begins its to since lost it's lost its command of the seas, and suddenly the Soviet Union is becoming the great power. This brilliant conspiracy got way out of their hands. They lost control. <laughs> they did not do what they thought it would do. And their their attempts to play God failed in the most miserable way. And yet I've seen books that just trace, you know, Illuminati, Round Table, Bilderbergers, whatever, <laughs> as one unbroken <laughs> sequence of successful conspiracies. Conspiracies do accomplish things, but they're not always that very successful. Uh, Heyman's well, conspiracy. I mean, you think of the Illuminati itself, where yeah. it's like <laughs> it existed for what fifteen years in the nineteenth yeah. century and dissolved horribly, and everyone's like, "Oh, it's still continuing. It's yeah. still running things to this day." No, they're all dead in Bavaria. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, we, we, this is in part a book on conspir- on conspiracy theory. Yes. Here's a conspiracy, begun for dumb reasons, supported by stupid, wicked people. For that their crash, own reasons. For their own reasons, that <laughs> immediately crashes and bursts. Yes, it does do harm. We, 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 by the time we get to Nehemiah, we see that part of the attack on the Jewish people included an attack on Jerusalem, and the walls have been broken down and the gates burned. And, and probably some, a few people died along the way. And yet, by and large... Esther looks at the at the consequences as largely positive. Lots of people became Jews. 
whatever that might mean. And the Jewish people had a prime minister in the Persian court who was looking after them and taking care of them. So that's that's where these conspiracies go. And, and we as Christians really need to learn to stop being afraid of them and, and to stop spending all our time trying to learn about them and expose them and educate people on them. As a matter of entertaining history, that's one thing. But as a matter of letting it set your religious assumptions or your eschatology, well, that's something very else. And it can be, can be a very dangerous sort of thing. Well, Haman gets promoted and he finds out that Mordecai will not bow and he decides he's going to set his sights on the entire Jewish people. And he pulls up a calendar and starts casting lots, yes, no, across all the days of the calendar to find the lucky day. Because like so many people, the Persians were astrologers and um, the, the movement of the calendar was was religiously or magically significant. So he starts doing this and it's Okay, day one, no, day two, no, day three, no, day four, day 20, no, day 30, no. This is no. very improbable. Yes, day 300, no, day, you know, I, I, on any given roll of the die, or flip of a coin in this case, black, white, stone, it is 50-50. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure how you calculate the average over 300 and some, I think it's 340 so days, I think at that point, probably the odds shift somehow. I, I should ask um, <laughs> uh, Tim French or one of the uh, men I know who's better with statistics than I am, how you would, how you calculate things when it's that long and, and over that much time. But surely in our experience, if you get that many no's, if you get 340 no's, and then suddenly you get a yes, that's when you say, I should be afraid. I should be very <laughs> afraid. Something significant has happened. Yeah, something just changed. But Haman jumps up and out, oh, wait, that's the perfect day. And when the day comes, he sends out letters by post to tell all the empire, if you got, hey, you got Jewish neighbors you hate, you want their stuff, on that day you can go for it, you've got the full support of the emperor and the empire and the armies and the bureaucracy. And the Jews are perplexed and worried. The whole palace, Susa, Sushan, is is perplexed and worried, uh, which is interesting because it's it's largely not made up of Jewish people. But apparently, the Jewish people were not hated and despised in the capital because the whole city is a little. Oh, what's this all about? And now we're in trouble. And Mordecai appeals to Esther, "You're the queen. Go talk to your husband." And she says, "It's not quite how things work." You have to be summoned into his presence. If you go presumptuously, you die, unless he extends mercy in the form of a golden scepter. And I have not been to see my husband in a month. So Esther does not know. Yes, she was the favorite. She's the queen. These emperors, we, we really need to reckon with a different kind of psychology. The, the Persian kings didn't think they were gods, but they thought they were awfully close. And we, we look at you know, some of our leaders in Washington and such on the, in the White House and the courts, and we think they're pretty full of themselves. These men seriously not only thought they were the right hand of God, so did everyone around them. And when they say, you can't come here unless I ask you, they actually do mean it. It's not a joke. It's not a bluff. Uh, they were used to executing people who presumed to come in. We know in Nehemiah, Nehemiah knew he shouldn't even be sad in the emperor's presence because to be in the emperor's presence, even when invited, was uh, when invited was such a joy and a privilege that you better be happy. And, and so Esther's looking at this and saying, uh, my husband hasn't really talked to me for a month. That doesn't really sound favorable and I could get myself killed. And Mordecai replies, um, get over yourself, tough. It may be that God has put you here for such a time as this. God's going to save his people. He doesn't say God. Remember the word God never appears in the text. His sentence is very passive. Deliverance will arise to the Jews from someplace else, but you and your father's house will perish. Uh, and she says, all right, well, go fast for me. The one religious practice that's, miss that's mentioned is fasting without reference to prayer, although presumably they would have prayed. And An interesting contrast to feasting, which sort of organizes the rest of the book. Yeah. Oh, good point. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, the whole book is is wrapped up in feasts. From the first feast, uh, where Vashti says no to her husband, 
to Esther's feast when she's queen. Um, there are a, a number of other feasts along the way, and it culminates with two feasts that Esther throws. Yeah, this is the one fast. This is the one time in the middle where we're not celebrating and where things are kind of scary. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what intervention will come, because again, we're not even using the name of God here. God, <laughs> God is not using his own name. That's something to talk about later. And uh, so Esther says fast. I'll go into the king. If I perish, I perish. And she goes in. Now, we all know how it, how that goes, but the first audience may not have known exactly. And it's supposed to be kind of a cliffhanger. What will happen? What will happen? But he raises the golden scepter, invites her in, knows that this has got to be something terribly serious, and offers formally to half my kingdom, whatever you want. And she kind of beats about the bush and says, I want you to come to a feast, I'm going to, a banquet I'm going to prepare, and bring Haman. And then I'll tell you what this is about. So the king, the emperor comes, so does Haman. Haman is stoked. He's got a private invitation with the emperor and the, and the queen. Wow. And the king again realizes this is, this is not what you want. What is this really about? He's, he's not completely stupid. A little naive in picking Haman as his prime minister, but he, he realizes something's going on here. And she says, um, uh, if I found favor in your sight, if you this and that, uh, come to another bank or prepare tomorrow, and now, then I'll tell you. And Haman goes away rejoicing. And as he goes away, he runs into Mordecai, who still will not bow. And she goes, he goes home and tells his wife and his friends, how great he is and how everything's so wonderful and everything's going going so well. But it, 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 it avails me nothing as long as I see Mordecai there not bowing. And his wife says, well, you know what? And we talked about this already. Why don't you build a gallows for him and then ask the, the king, the emperor, for permission to hang him? That's it. That's great. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So they start building this this gallows, which is quite high. I feel like this wife. Just, <laughs> She's an interesting character, isn't she? I mean, I, I just, it's one of those examples of like, the husband has this problem and he's so absorbed in it. And then the wife comes along, very problem solving. Also very callous, which is how women tend to be with these things. Right? <laughs> like, well, have him executed, obviously. Oh. You know? <laughs> Think of Jezebel and Ahab here. Exactly. That's that's the I mean, that was the comparison I was gonna draw next. It's yeah. like, wow, you know, husbands gotta choose better wives. <laughs> 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 these guys anyway. <laughs> oh well, that night. They're go getters. Say what you will about them. They are girl bosses. <laughs> Girl boss, gatekeep, gaslight. <laughs> the um, the text then shifts and tells us that night the king couldn't sleep. We're not told why. Insomnia of some sort. And he calls for the royal chronicles, probably thinking if anything can put me to sleep, it'll be that. And they're read aloud before him. And it comes to the part where Mordecai had his testimony and saved the king's life. And he asks, well, what, what, what did we do about that? We reward him? No, not, nothing was done. Huh. And so the king thinks about that. We're not told if he ever gets to sleep or not. Because <laughs> early in the morning, Haman's there all ready to ask for Mordecai's execution. And the king notices there's someone out in the, in the court waiting. Who is that? It's Haman. Oh, bring him in. Just a guy. Just a guy. Haman, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Haman thinks. Oh, who would the king delight to honor more than me? Well, and he lists a whole bunch of things. Uh, public parade and adornment, the king's crown and attire hmm. and such. And the king said, that's great. Take all that stuff and do this to Mordecai the Jew. And Haman, without a word, does it all because you don't defy the king. <laughs> We're not told how Mordecai took all this. Probably a little amused and amused at the whole thing because he doesn't care about <laughs> such things. And, and and when it's all done, Haman comes back and tells his wife, this is what just happened. And she says, basically, Mordecai, oh, that was Mordecai, the Jew, the guy you're trying to kill? Oh, honey, you're so dead. 
Thanks, dear. And while that conversation is going on, the guards come to take him to the fa- the banquet. He's almost forgotten. So again, the banquet takes place. And again, the king says, what do you really want? What's going on here to half my kingdom? And finally, Esther tells the truth. Um, my people, I, I, I want my life. I want the life of my people. If we'd been sold as slaves, that I, I, I wouldn't even be here. But they're trying to kill us all. And the king says, who is he? And where is he who would do, dare do this thing? Haman's sitting there. Well, he's right there. (laughs) Funny you ask. Funny you should ask. (laughs) Presumably, Haman's hearing this, and little by little, the pieces are clicking together of, huh, death death on a genocidal level. That sounds, oh, that sounds like uh, something I do. It's brilliant. I don't... (laughs) Uh oh! <laughs> I can see this as like Esther's playing a little dumb, you know. Like, yeah. I think his name is Ha Ha Man. <laughs> hey, hey man, that's yeah. right. Uh, yeah, oh my goodness, hey man. He's right here. The adversary the enemy is this wicked Haman. Well, Haman's terrified. The king, uh, as was well, he, the king has a temper, and people have pointed this out. But each time we see the temper about to go off, he always removes himself. From the situation, lets himself cool down, and then generally gets advice. That's what had happened with Vashti. He didn't just fly off the hammer and order something horrible. He he calmed down and asked his counselors. So here again, for fear of of doing the wrong thing, because Haman's an important person right here. But of course, his wife is here too. And as we're talking about an entire population group, and he is the- theoretically as emperor responsible for. It, he probably should take that into into mind. And he still doesn't quite probably understand who this people is, because he's had reports from Jerusalem and has seemed to favor the Jews. This would be in the book of Ezra. But he hasn't put two and two together yet. So he storms out into the garden, trying to calm down and get his mind around what he knows. Haman realizes he's dead. The only one here who could possibly save him would be Esther, because you know, the girl. If I appeal to the girl. They women have soft hearts and soft heads, I'm thinking, and I can just win her if I just show enough sorrow and repentance here. And so he goes and falls. And in those days, they didn't sit at tables. They reclined around them. So she's on a couch with her feet stretched out away from the table. And he falls on top of her to plead for his life. And we're not told what she does. Probably looks askance and says, what is going on here? At this point, the king walks back in and sees Haman laying on top of the queen. Not a good look. Not no. Uh, bad, yeah. <laughs> bad optics, as we say. <laughs> My wife just taught this to her her elementary class, and uh, she said their response was awkward. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. So they got it. They yeah. They uh, you know it's something that's not always uh, again one of those things that in in teaching Esther, some teachers just kind of either don't get or don't really explain. Yes, because she, the king says, what, is he going to force the queen in front of me? The word force means rape. Mm-hmm. Is he going to rape the queen while I'm standing here? Because right now, mass genocide, what's a rape compared to that? Um, so he, before he can even say anything, we're in Esther's little house, her own little domain, her servants, they all love her. And so as soon as the king has given any kind of indication that he's done with, with Haman, they grab a bag or something and put it over Haman's head and mouth so he can't talk and defend himself. And they say something like, I was just asking for mercy. I didn't mean to look like that. They don't let him get a word out. He stepped on a lot of people on the way up, and they're all remembering him as he comes down. And so they, they look at the king and say, Your Majesty, there's this gallows that he <laughs> built for Mordecai, who saved your life, King says, hang him on it. And they do. And there's the gallows, the Antichrist hung on a tree, and it begins the process of salvation for the Jewish people. But we, we've still got a couple problems. Um, there's this thing that we found out way back in Daniel. The law of the Medes and Persians cannot, cannot be, all, be altered. You know. And so Hazarira says, um, I'm on your side, babe, but um, I can't undo this. It's already on the calendar. Yeah, Calendar's it's set. set. So the well, Google invites have been sent. <laughs> uh, 
uh, in a little more ra uh, religious and magical sense, I speak for the gods and the gods have to remain consistent. Which is why on other occasions, the emperors will learn to say, until I change my mind. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, until you hear from me. <laughs> until you hear from me. This is what you're going to do. Until you hear from me, because I mean, you know, I'm leaving myself a loophole here. He had not done this this time. But he does say, look, uh, oh, this is Mordecai. Oh, he's, he's your cousin, like an uncle to you. He's the one who saved my life. And Mordecai, who just tried to rape you, is his enemy. Okay, I got this. Haman. Haman. Here, take the ring. I, I'll take this ring off Haman. I give it to you. It's my signet. You're not my prime minister. And you too, Mordecai Esther, you can write letters to whoever you want, however you want, invoking whatever royal authority. You can't undo what I've said, but you can add to it. And if you can think of anything that will help, go for it. You got my complete backing. And with a little thought, they simply write to the Jews everywhere and say, and make it very public. The emperor is now on your side. He gives you permission to defend yourselves, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. In our world, we don't, in the West, in America particularly, we don't think that we have to appeal to our governor to get permission to do self-defense. Unless we live in Well, at, after the last thing in the, in the uh, pandemic, maybe we are beginning to think that. But originally, nobody in America would think such a stupid thing. But in that world, you did. You had to have permission to draw weapons, use weapons, you know, all that. Well, the emperor grants it. Furthermore, the entire imperial bureaucracy and military will be on your side. Now, that didn't end the threat because there were still some people who didn't care. They figured they could still take out some of God's people, come away with some loot, that it, the, between their, their anger and bitterness on the one hand and their greed on the other, it was worth a shot. Others looked, pulled back and said, uh, when this is over, Mordecai, this Jewish guy, is going to be prime minister, and the queen is now a self-confessed Jew. I think I'm going to be on their side now, because it's <laughs> going to be more profitable on every level. And furthermore, we're told that a lot of people were just flat out afraid of Mordecai and began to take this whole God of Israel thing seriously, and many people became Jews. Nice. For fear of what was going on here. So this did launch a revival of some sort. How deep? God knows. But there were prophecies that God would set up his throne in Elam, which is Persia. So this this is something. It's it's although it's barely mentioned, it is important to the story. Well, the the day comes, the enemies come, the Jews fight, they win, they don't take the the spoil for themselves. Uh, what they do with it is unclear. They may have turned it over to the king or just let it sit there in a rod, or they may have sent it to Jerusalem to be used in the temple. One of our teachers at school just reminded me or pointed out to me this week as we were going through Esther um, that this sounds a lot like what happened with Saul when he took Agag and the Amalekites. He was not supposed to mm. take the spoil and oh. did. Yeah, and did, and it got him in all sorts of trouble. So if the Jews are taking this as an extension of that original conflict, then perhaps they, they realize that at least the spoil is not for them. Whether or not they too will give it to the Lord their God, which is what Saul said he was going to do, is not completely clear. And apparently it's not that big a deal at this point for us. The last thing that happens is that Mordecai and Esther declare a feast. With royal authority, they say, this is going to be a day that the Jews are going to celebrate. And in fact, we're going to celebrate in perpetuity till the end of time. And we're going to call it, uh, Haman tried to, to find a day, day to kill us by throwing lots. The word for a lot is pure, P-U-R, per. So we're going to call this feast Purim, lots. And it continues to be celebrated among God's people, or the Jew, among God's people to the time of Christ and the Jewish people ever since. Uh, and there would be nothing wrong with God, with the Christians celebrating it after a fashion and recognizing, again, God's great acts in history. Yeah. Costumes are fun. Yeah. Baskets full of baked goods are fun. Yeah. And, and that's how kind of how it's described. They they had joy and light and a good time and sent portions to one another. Sounds a little bit like our Christmas without some of the materialism. Mm -hmm. One thing that we could consider as we 
now go back and pick up some pieces here and there. Starting there, um, they weren't prophets, they weren't priests, there was no divine voice from Sinai, and yet they established a feast that God's people celebrated throughout the, the rest of Old Covenant life, and God at no point seems to have objected. They understood that it is good and right to celebrate from generation to generation the great acts of God in history. And this was a pretty great act. This was the salvation of the Jewish people and the Messianic line. And so they did not hesitate to add a feast to the calendar. And so we can consider this in terms of um, what we sometimes call the regular principle of worship. It, it conforms. God's people had, and God himself had set up feasts to honor his great acts, and they extended that. Well, here's another great act. And we, God's people, are coming of age to such a point that just as Zerubbabel and Joshua, and then and shortly Nehemiah, will reinstitute a new covenant, a restoration covenant, without explicit divine authority, although there are lots of hints and suggestions and encouragements. They, Esther and Mordecai, also say, look, we can add a feast, and we ought to, to the glory of God. Now, again, the text does not say glory of God. <laughs> so here, here are some things we can talk about now. I want to go back and talk about um, the beauty contest, because we kind of skimmed over that. And I want to talk about this idea of God's people growing up. And I want to talk uh, about the whole lack of God's name, his worship, the prophets. What's God doing there? Why? What, what's that all about? So, who'd like to take what here? Well, with the, with the so-called beauty contest, I think it's as important as ever, as we've said several times, not to turn the Bible into a cast of heroes who were morally impeccable. Like we talked mm -hmm. about this with Mordecai, we're not quite agreed or sure of how to read him or mm -hmm. how God viewed his, the stance that he took. But neither do we really know about Esther. As, as my pastor in college used to say, oh, it was a beauty contest. Or, <laughs> oh, it was a talent show. And she won. So <laughs> um, we, we don't know. We don't know what to make of her. And it's okay, because that's not the point. Uh, for those of you who may not understand this, uh, this is something I, I was confessing to Emily earlier that I missed for a very long time. Uh, all of those women who came before the king, he took to bed, and they became his wives. They they departed from his bed to his harem. To they became concubines, that is, unendowered wives who were true wives, but. They would almost certainly never see him and never see his bed again. They effectively, by spending a night with him, became nuns for the rest of their life. Pampered, provided for, best food, best clothes, but completely shut off from any male contact, wives in name only, as it were, used women. And I, we need to look at that and say, that's bad. That's the, the, there's a lot good you can say about Ahasuerus by the end of the book, but at this point, the way he treats women is, is not acceptable. And and Esther had to go through that. She did not have much of a choice. She could have screamed and 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 made a scene. Whether or not that would have helped is another question. Mm -hmm. She could have killed herself. Some people, even Bible teachers, would probably suggest that rather than submit to such a thing, suicide's an option. I don't Augustine think so has words yeah. to say about yeah, that. <laughs> Augustine doesn't agree. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 nor do I. I don't think mm -hmm. that's you're you're not the guilty party, and we need to put place values in the right place. But as we look, this is a pagan empire. Despite mm -hmm. the fact it's going to get a Jewish prime minister and it's going to have a Jewish queen, and despite this fact that this king does great things for God's kingdom and may in the end actually be saved. We may see him in heaven. Right now, with this king, this thing we run into, it's not a godly society. It's not safe, and it has a very low attitude toward women. And the idea that and somehow that's, when that's kind of a, a, a indicator, the yeah. how how a society treats its women. Yeah, 
But the interesting thing is that for the last hundred years or so, Christians have been blamed for lowering the status of women, for treating women so poorly. <laughs> It's because this people don't know. It's historically laughable. It is historically laughable, but people don't read history anymore. <laughs> they just assume when they hear things about Paul talking about submission and obedience that, well, he's just a woman hater, and and surely pagan societies were better than that. Uh, no, uh, no. <laughs> they, they See Tom no. Holland on this. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. See Tom Holland, also any historian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's yeah. This this is not a secret. Well, this, this I I can't speak opinion. that highly of the discipline of history today. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, That's no, fair. Any, uh, any serious historian? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anybody who's actually read the primary just sources, of, uh, you know, any true Scotsman will tell you this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just thinking yes. uh, as an example of you know the the, the rights of life and death that a um, paterfamilias had. Mm. It's like yeah, you they could just decide they didn't like you that day and and legally be okay with killing you or having you executed or something like that. So we're looking at a pagan society that treats women very poorly, horribly, in fact. And uh, it's into this that Esther came and through this she navigated and God blessed her. And as you say, we don't know her heart. Uh, we know that she tried to submit to her parent figure through all of this. and that Or maybe, maybe she thought it was practically useful to conceal <laughs> her identity if everybody she, hated she Jews. She may have. Uh, so, the, the, yeah. So there's that. How about the, there's no mention of God here, or his word, or the prophets, or Jerusalem, or worship. There's only mention of Jews and fasting. Uh, maybe this will help you understand my question. As I said, I grew up in a home where conspiracy theory was huge. On the on one of the shelves in our house, there was a, a kind of paperback thrown together book, maybe or after maybe, that argued. I just looked at it once or twice to see what in the world is this thing, and then had nothing more to do with it. it basically, it argued that Esther is not a part of scripture, that it is a, a, a Zionist propaganda document that it shows the way Jews really think, and they're all about their, their gleeful attempt to destroy uh, people who see them for what they are. And it went on and on like that. This, this was never a part of Scripture, wasn't part of the Bible when Jesus came to earth, and so on and so on. And what allowed this author to make some distance with this, I think, was the fact that there's no explicit mention of God or His promise. You could look at it and say, this is a secular book. There's There's nothing religious about it. So, what do you think God's up to here? And what, what can we learn from it? Well, most of life is that way. I mean, not <laughs> that most of our Christian life doesn't make mention of Jesus or, or God or miracles or promises, but day-to-day -day life, A, we don't have miracles every day or they wouldn't be called miracles. <laughs> um, B, God does not write his name in the sky for us to read every day. He did put it in a book. But that's no. that's different. Um, but we don't live our life waiting for a miracle. We live our life taking the actions that are appropriate and wise for us to take if we can. That's you know, if we want to know how God works, this is a great book to read mm -hmm. because he's um, worked through sinful people's choices. Right. My my cheater's answer is. Yeah. Of course, it's still a religious book because it's a book talking about history, and history yeah. is, <laughs> yeah. takes place in God's world. There you go. Mm -hmm. The poem that I, I just keep seeing referenced by various people is, um, ironically, I can't remember the title, but I know it's Jared Manley Hopkins. Mm -hmm. The earth is charged with the grandeur of God. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And no less the things that happen on the earth. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have to make a book religious. We just have to make sure, if it's one we're writing, that it's the right religion. Yeah. <laughs> and God well, is showing us in part that that doesn't necessarily require us to have his name all over it or a conversion scene by chapter three. It could even be a revenge oh, story. It could be a revenge <gasps> story. Well, yeah. I'm looking for a six-fingered man. <laughs> <laughs> you don't happen to have six fingers, do you? Uh, uh <laughs> Relatedly, uh, I, I think I don't remember if you said it before we started the the episode properly, or if you 
said it in the beginning, but there is sort of a indication here about telling stories that are fictional as well. Mm -hmm. And the sort of, I don't want to say it's a arch example because it it is late in history, but Lord of the Rings, Mm -hmm. it takes place in a world that is suffused with theological meaning yes. and importance. And if you read the Silmarillion, it's a bit more It becomes very explicit, about it. yeah. <laughs> um, with the Numenorians particularly worshipping Eru Iluvatar, which is God. And <laughs> But if you read Lord of the Rings, you get a couple of scant references to Eru. Right. And for the... I think maybe a dozen references to the Valar. Mm-hmm. But for the most part... The most you get is there's a big bad guy who's a spirit and he's trying to kill us. Yeah. We should kill him back. <laughs> kill him first, preferably. Yeah, exactly. It's like there, there's something there yeah. um, well, in Esther that points to this uh, as a legitimate story to tell. It's not immoral. To yes. tell a story that does not explicitly say, by the way, Jesus died for your sins. Have you considered mm-hmm. becoming a Christian and joining his church? <laughs> well, a lot of people did at that time based on what they saw happening, it seems. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm glad you brought in Lord of the Rings. There is one of the almost, but not quite, explicit references to God. Frodo's, or, um, Gandalf is talking to Frodo and says, I can make it no more clear than to say that Bilbo was meant to find the ring, mm. and not by its owner, and therefore you were meant to have it. Now, Ero Luvatar a, is not mentioned there. there <laughs> this is a <laughs> passive sentence, kind of like a, a deliverance will arise to the Jews from someplace else. Mm-hmm. Not God will do it. And, and, and Gandalf was saying, I can't make any clearer. Yes, Gandalf, you really could have. <laughs> Aluvatar has ordained you from the foundation of the world. I am full of his Holy Spirit, the secret fire. And I tell you this because I'm an angel. <laughs> no, he's not as clear as he could be, and it would change the entire tenor of the book had he been that clear, and it would scare a lot of people off, honestly. Of course, did any of the angels that you encountered in Europe walk up to you and say, hey, I'm an angel, let me help you? No, no, they didn't. Okay, I'm not going to tell the angel stories. <laughs> oh, <They're> dang. Just... <laughs> oh, <darn. laughs> That's were, for uh, another t- time. Tell us yeah. after the episode is done. Yeah, <laughs> there, there, there was a time when my my friend David Farshman and I, we were both much younger, went to Europe. He just graduated. And there were a couple incidences where we were in situations that humanly speaking were hopeless we were going to get lost in germany and no way out and and people just showed up two people in particular and 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 supplied what we needed and in retrospect as we look back on what they did for us it was um it was it, it was absolutely necessary because we couldn't figure out what to do but each of them in some way didn't live up to his billing. One guy said, I'm bicycling across Europe, but had no bicycle. He wanted to get to a train. And yet, as soon as he found the way to get there, he went and had coffee and left us to go to the train. The other was a woman, a uh, military officer for NATO who got off the bus, but had never gotten on it and walked up and said, hi, guys, what can I, how can I help you? <laughs> so, you know. I got you to tell the angel stories. Okay. Real fast version, though. But anyway... <laughs> Were they angels or well, certainly they were angels in the sense that God sent them to us to help. Mm-hmm. Were they spirits? We'll ask God someday, but there are a lot of really unexplained questions. Although it's left me with this legacy, anytime I'm someplace, particularly Europe, I look for a chance to be that angel and to walk in on somebody and just supply them with help and then leave without a word just to play mind games with them. So, <laughs> Uh, and anyway, so what you, what you have said already has sort of brought us there, and I mentioned it earlier. We're coming to the end of Old Covenant history, and God is making his people grow up. Mm-hmm. He, they're not, he's not providing prophets. He's not providing miracles. The sun does not move in the sky. The rivers don't turn to blood. Frogs, frogs don't uh, multiply out of the river. No lightning from heaven. The king has a feud with his wife and gets a new wife. <laughs> He can't sleep and needs some chronicles read to him. A queen has enough courage to go risk her life to save her people. And you can look at that and say, well, this didn't require God. There was no miracle here. 
oh, this absolutely required God. Oh, yeah. As you say, every bit of it is charged with divinity. This is God's history. And hell is screaming, no, not fair! Kind and, of like Gretchen going to bed right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and I want to touch on something just mm-hmm. in the phrasing where you're saying, it's like he's, he's making, he, he's helping his people grow up. Yeah. And what immediately sprang to mind is Jeremiah when he says, I will make a covenant with you that is not like the covenant right. that I made with your fathers when I led them by the hand. Ah, uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Out of Egypt. It's that childlike imagery. It's like they were very much childish uh, as well, but he's he's helping them yeah. to not not in the ultimate sense make do without him. But <laughs> no, but to rely. Well, here here's to the live thing: by faith, not by sight. Yeah, yeah. By the time we're done with this, we're going to have God's people scattered throughout a pagan world, living among pagan neighbors and pagan neighborhoods, going to assembly on the Sabbath day and reading the word of God and singing praises to him and then going out and witnessing to their Gentile neighbors about Messiah. Well, there we go. Does this sound like anything that's about <laughs> to happen in the world? When when the apostles go out, the synagogues are there, and a lot of them just became churches mm-hmm. because they all read the, all the practical everyday stuff was in place. God was getting them ready not not to have priests, but to have lay leaders, not to have new scripture, but to read the scriptures and study the scriptures they had, and not to be a people turning inward because we're the people of the promise, but turn outward to win God-fearers and even even um, converts to Judaism. And, and so when Paul and the others go out, this is what they find, and it's their launching pad for the gospel into the Roman Empire. So God's getting his people ready. And this is one st- one evidence, one step where we see, yeah, this is how Christians live. Sometimes we, someone just can't sleep and something happens because of it. Sometimes someone does a good deed and good comes back from it. Sometimes you go ask the authorities to do something really cool and surprise, surprise, they actually do it. I just got my jury do- duty shifted because I actually ask. My, my, my wife has scheduled a... Uh, or uh, an anniversary th- th- thing for us over on the coast. It's right there. We we missed. Can 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 you move? I know you can't, but you know if there's anything you could do. Oh, you want us to move it? Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? Yeah, we'll just move it. What? You can do that? Yeah. No, this, how about how about you know two weeks later? I don't have a calendar, but I don't care. That's wonderful. <laughs> At you know, this little, little thing, but for us right now, it's a, kind of a big thing. And sometimes we don't ask people in power. We just assume they're opposed to the gospel and it's useless. And sometimes they're just ordinary people doing their job. And sometimes they're even nice. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they may actually have some Christian influence. They may even be Christians quietly, like uh, Obadiah, who was Ahab's steward. Mm-hmm. So we are not to be ashamed or afraid of our Christianity. We're not to be ashamed to witness. We're not to be quiet about who we are as Christians. Uh, we don't need to be obnoxious, but we need to tell the truth. And we need to, as you say, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. And not well, one of the problems with the Pentecostal slash charismatic movements, are not the same, mm-hmm. is this tendency to want to live by miracle, mm-hmm. by new revelation by new input from God, rather than saying, you know, we have the Bible. It's sufficient. Let's learn it really, really, really well, and then try to apply it by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I guess those are our lessons, and thank you. I was really concerned this would fall down into just telling the story. (laughs) It's a wonderful story, but as you say, people can read it for themselves, and (laughs) presumably did when we had them paused. Yeah. I hope they didn't pause and then go watch Veggie Tales. <laughs> oh, there's um, another discussion yeah. we're gonna. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's make some recommendations okay. before we sign off. Okay. I think Brian had his recommendation thrust upon him. <laughs> some he seemed ready choose to give it. a recommendation. Others have a recommendation <laughs> thrust upon them. <laughs> uh, yes. So mine is uh, the subject of the past several weeks of labor on my part, which I built from scratch three raised garden beds, which we 
layered in logs and some mulch from our ducks over the winter and compost and topsoil and finally peat moss so that we can have a garden again. Uh, last year, we did not have raised garden beds. We just kind of used the real estate on the periphery of our lawn. And we, we got we got some stuff <laughs> that grew and we were able to eat. Um, I think we actually still have one of the butternut squash still in our freezer. Um, <laughs> nice. But we basically said, you know, we want to do more. And so I started building these raised garden beds. Basically, the recommendation is get outside and build something. If you feel so inclined, if that's something that you want to put on your personal resume. <laughs> um, and then also gardening. Gardening is a wonderful way to enjoy God's creation and have something to show for it that is practical. If you, for some reason, need a practical outcome at the end of your <laughs> efforts to justify it to yourself uh gardening is a great way to do that our our god planted a garden at the beginning of history and he said it was very good so you know you can take part in that image wise you can image that one of the women who came to the tomb mistook jesus for the gardener um <laughs> it's also fun it's just it's fun Maybe that makes me boring, but I don't care. It's fun. So that's my fresh, recommendation. Fresh air Build. and exercise and time with your spouse. Exactly. Build a thing and spend time with your loved ones taking care of addressing and keeping a garden. There you go. Thank you. Emily, I think you're supposed to go next. Yeah, I'm. I'm coming up short because my life has also been taken up with things that might sound boring, but I think I well, fun. That's all right. Go for it. <laughs> Tell us about the boring stuff. Come on. Well, today I made a salad for dinner that we have not yet eaten, but oh. we used a bunch of stuff that we haven't used before. So we had some radishes and turnips. Uh, we've been eating uh, chard this week, mm -hmm. oh. which is really good in scrambled eggs. Oh, Get yeah. some, some ham or bacon and then saute the, the chard and then scramble your eggs. Mm -hmm. It's real nice. So I, I really liked the turnips. Radishes are the super strong peppery ones, right? But yeah. turnips are just so, just, they're chill and they're refreshing. And I think <laughs> turnips are underrated. And that is my recommendation for the did, day. Did you cook the turnips at all or did no. you just eat them raw? So this, raw. This, was in your, this was in your salad, not in the eggs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to be even less impressive than either of you, but it kind of build on both of you. And that's, you should all grow um, green onions. Oh, this, yeah. This is a very easy thing to do when you, you buy some green onions from the store. You save the heads with the little roots attached. You can stick them in the little jar or cup of we water. We have them in a mason thing. jar on our yeah. window. So, yeah. yeah. It's great. And, and just let them grow. And then in time, you take them out and you plant them and they get... I'm just looking out the window at ours. They get super huge if you forget to use them. Don't have <laughs> yeah. to use them. And in the end, they puff at the end and have these little blossoms and spread more seeds. But you can go out, once they're, they're settled, you can go out every other day or so and just chop a few off. If you plant enough, you have green onions for the year and beyond. Mm -hmm. They just keep, they keep coming back. Eventually, they get kind of big and you probably want to replace them. But you want to do a salad, you want to do scrambled eggs. Scallion pancakes. Yeah, all kinds Chinese of things. Chinese street food. It, and, and, and the thing is, you can plant them anything. We have some in, in our planters. We have um, an orange, tr not an orange tree, it's an orange rose tree that's mm -hmm. kind of falling over. But I just put some in there because, hey, it's dirt <laughs> and handy. And, and they grow just fine. They don't, they're not dainty. They don't require a lot. And then you don't have to buy things at the store, but you, you want to just make something a little nicer. There it is. It's fresh. It's real. You grew it. There you go. My mm, recommendation. Yep. Solid. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been a super fun episode to record. So listeners, I hope you enjoyed listening to it as well. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, let us know what you think about Mordecai and Esther and anything else you want to tell us about by emailing us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Um, we would still love your recommendations. I don't know if we will have recorded, we'll probably have recorded our episode by the time you hear this, but you can still send us recommendations. We'll <laughs> still enjoy them. 
Um, if you would like to support us financially, you can do that by visiting our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or become a patron at patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Uh, you can follow us on YouTube, theoretically Facebook, uh, Spotify, any other podcast catcher, and share us with a friend. Big thank you to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband, to our transcriptionist, and to our financial supporters. Thanks for keeping the show rolling, all y'all. Have a good night. See you next time.